Hey, future social workers. Welcome to week five of Social Work 310. Great um, topic this week. We're going to talk a lot about healthcare. We're going to um, discuss, I have a, an assignment for you to write a worksheet and uh, answer the following questions. First of all, as a country, most of our healthcare dollars are invested in treatment rather than prevention. What are the implications of this for vulnerable populations and economic policy? That's really kind of two questions, isn't it? How has COVID-19 impacted our healthcare system? And do you have a story about how the healthcare system hasn't or has worked for you? Um, what made it work or not work? And if you feel comfortable sharing that, I would love to hear about that. Also, if you want to include some of what you learned today in the lecture, that might be good in the worksheet that you do. Okay, um, we're gonna talk a lot about privilege today. I would like to start out by defining what privilege is and the Webster's Dictionary, Merriam-Webster Dictionary, says that privilege is a right or immunity granted as a peculiar benefit, advantage, or favor or prerogative. Um, especially such a right or immunity attached specifically to a position or an office. When I was a young mom raising children, um, we used privilege a lot. We talked about privilege a lot because if a child did something that was inappropriate, a privilege was taken away from them. I know a lot of you are parents, and that's kind of how we—that's <clears throat> kind of how we roll, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> not everything is a right. Watching television isn't a right. Maybe that's a privilege that you need to earn. Um, playing on a computer is something that that you earn. And so with my children, they always had a list of chores that they did every day before they got to do the fun things. We we did a lot of delayed gratification where they did, had to do the hard thing first. And so, interesting, all of my children have become um, very accomplished musicians. And I think partly that was because that practice piano uh, chore was the most fun out of all of the chores on their to-do lists. That was something that uh, was much more enjoyable than perhaps scrubbing a toilet. So so we, we talk about privilege with our children. We um, Lately, privilege has been, has been a buzzword, hasn't it? It's something that we hear on the media a lot. Why? Why do we talk about it so much? You know, as social workers, you should be very well acquainted with Peggy McIntosh. Peggy McIntosh wrote it, a paper in 1988 called Unpacking White Privilege Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. If you have not read the whole paper, I highly challenge you to do so. It's, it's very, very good, very insightful. I want to share with you part of that paper. Um, so Peggy decided that she wanted to work on herself by um, identifying some of the daily effects of white privilege in her own life. And so she, she made a list of things that she could do. She said, as far as I can tell, my African-American coworkers, friends, and acquaintances with whom I come into daily or frequent contact in this particular time, place, and time of work cannot count on most of these conditions. And then she listed the conditions. Now, it's interesting, this was written in 1988, which is a long time ago, but many of these conditions that she listed are still very applicable today. I can, I can, if I wish, arrange to be in the company of people of my race most of the time. Now, um, can you say that about who you are and where you're living? I hope so, because uh, feeling that feeling of belonging is very important to the human psyche. Feeling like you fit in, like you belong, and and race can be a big part of that. <clears throat> I lived in East Cleveland, as I've shared with you, and uh, I was I was one of the only white people, so I kind of felt like I had an experience where I understood that a little better. As a child, I lived in Guatemala, and again, I was one of the only white people. Um, it's been explained to me by some of my African-American and uh, Latino friends that it's very different when the broader culture, when you're a part of the 
majority culture and you see people of your color all over the television screen and in the broader culture, then those experiences are, are seen differently. And uh, I had one, I worked one of my first social worker jobs in the inner city of East Cleveland. <clears throat> my, my boss was African American and she had to sit me down one day and explain to me, okay, where, where, uh, where did you get your first opportunity? And I'm like, well, I don't know. I mean, you know, what was, what was your first, I think what she said was on your resume, what was the first job that you listed that was something other than, you know, fast food or, um, more blue collar thing. And I'm like, Oh, well that's easy. That was working, um, at a doctor's office. It was my dad's doctor's office. Right. But because I got married and my last name was different than my dad, you know, future employers, all they saw was that I worked for Dr. Lyman. Well, my name was Laura Debenham, so they didn't know that it was my dad doing, you know, nepotism and giving me an opportunity to learn. But that did get my foot in the door of a uh, white collar um, experience and, and opening up to me privilege at a time. And the other thing that, that my, my colleague and my employer pointed out to me was you know, yeah, you live in East Cleveland and it's challenging for you because you are, you know, one of the only people of your uh, race in your neighborhood, but you can get on an airplane and leave, right? And I'm like, oh yeah, you know. And I realized a, a lot of people, you know, a lot of people live in the same, um, in the same neighborhood and experience. And you know, I, I mean, we experience that in rural Nevada, don't we? All of you know people who have never left the state or um or haven't been very far and and um and so travel is a privilege right wealth is a privilege the second one she said i can avoid spending time with people whom i was trained to mistrust and who have learned to mistrust my kind or me oh that's a good one if I should need to move, I can be pretty sure of renting or purchasing housing in an area which I can afford and in which I would want to live. I can be pretty sure my neighbors in such a location will be neutral or pleasant to me. I can go shopping alone most of the time, pretty well assured that I will not be followed or harassed. Can you say that? I can turn on the television or open to the front page of the paper and see people of my race wi widely represented. I am told, when I am told about national heritage or civilization, I am shown that people of my color made it what it is. We're progressing that way. I love the musical Hamilton and how that has opened up dialogue among um, people of color and the majority population. I can be sure that my children will be given curricular materials that testify to the existence of their race. So if you look back, you know, my, my growing up, my experience in elementary school is, you know, the, the Dick and Jane little textbooks that we read as first and second, third graders. It was all white children in there, wasn't it? Um, that's changing. And you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I actually posted on Facebook that I was going to be giving this lecture and it was really interesting to see um, the response of a lot of my friends and colleagues. Um, quite honestly, a lot of my white friends were a little bit taken aback. One said, uh, I like to use the term blessed rather than privileged. And you know, that's true, but that's also someone that's not really recognizing what their white privilege is all about. And this is just a really important conversation we need to have right now. And we need to have it. It needs to be a continued conversation that we have. Yes, 1988 was a long time ago, but we are still being impacted by this, um, as evidenced by the, the rioting going on and the, the anger going on in our culture. Um, one of my, my friends and colleagues who is from a minority, part of a minority population, said that if someone is fighting for the right to do something you've always been able to, you're privileged. If someone is fighting to be treated the way you expected to be treated, you're privileged. And what does fighting mean? Um, you know, struggling, um, 
trying to to make a statement that they deserve this and uh, another person said well are, are we talking about um, are we talking about having more rights for people of color than people of white than people who are the majority part of the population and uh, that, that's a that's an interesting conversation isn't it and I think it's important to recognize that in some ways um, we've had a reversal of privilege in the last few years. I noticed when, when I lived in East Cleveland, and this was um, 15, 15 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, oh my goodness. Um, but even then, the, a lot of the children that I saw having educational opportunities, and part of this was a result of Jonathan Kozal's work, which I hope you're starting to get familiar with. Uh, so much of his work impacted the educational community that there were a lot of people in the big cities that were volunteering in the inner cities and giving opportunities to some of the children living in the inner city, children of color, who had opportunities that maybe you don't see among the children living in rural parts of the United States, particularly rural Nevada, and it doesn't matter what color, but um, but they may not be getting the same opportunities that people in bigger cities are getting as a result of their locale and the lack of uh, people willing to do the voluntary work. They might know of the problems going on there, but it's just not as accessible. So that's something I think we look need to look at too. One of my colleagues talked about how privilege seems to be more about um, those with money and power and maybe not even as much about, about color, about race anymore, those who have and those who have not. I thought that was an interesting look at it as well. So I'm interested to hear your thoughts. It is a touchy subject, but it's an important conversation that we need to have. Um, I think that I think that Peggy McIntosh had some important things to say. She goes on to talk about um, that some of the conditions that show her privilege, that show whether or not someone has privilege is whether I use checks, credit cards, or cash, I can count on my skin color not to work against the appearance of financial reliability. Interesting. I can arrange to protect my children most of the time from people who might not like them. Kind of scary. Let me tell you about an experience that I had a few years ago. I might be repeating myself to some of you, but I think this was a very powerful experience. I was on the University of Nevada in Reno campus, and I was um, sitting in on one of their social work classes. Um, I had only worked for GBC for a couple of years and was kind of um, seeing what what the teach what the teaching was like that was going on at the university since this is a degree out of University of Nevada Reno um, I needed to to experience that it was a very full classroom there was probably 35 to 40 students in this classroom and that we were talking about privilege we were talking about um, the the clash at the time between the um, the criminal justice system and minority populations. And one Caucasian woman, young woman, um, raised her hand and said, you know what, I think you just need to obey the law and then you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about being um, assaulted by, by a police officer if you're just obeying the law. And the, the young man who raised his hand I thought handled himself very, very well. I was very impressed with this young man. He was um, probably mid-30s, so to some of you, maybe that doesn't seem like very young, but he was a young man to me. And uh, he raised his hand and he said, I think you need to check your privilege. Now that's a term that I think is very interesting. Check your privilege, what does that mean? And, and he said, he started his sentence with check your privilege. Let me tell you about my experience with police officers and what's going on in my life right now. He proceeded to share uh, the fact that he has a 14-year-old son. Um, this man was African-American. Uh, his 14-year-old son is African-American. And he said not only is his son um, 
of a minority race, but he also is autistic. And so there are times in their family where his autistic son has meltdowns. And he has had the neighbors call the cops on him on several occasions because his son is throwing a tantrum. And he said, you know, I've explained to the police officers my son's autistic, but his neighbors had this assumption because of his race that there was something derogatory going on. And I, and you know, the way the man handled himself, you know, he's obviously working hard to become a social worker, a very professional guy, also a very loving father. And so I thought that was really interesting. And um, it, it was surprising to me that someone at that level in her education could say something like that in a classroom. <laughs> I wanted to raise my hand, but you know what? My voice wouldn't have been heard as well as this young man's voice was heard. And so um, that was very impressive. Some other conditions are I can talk with my mouth full and not have people put this down to my color. Wow, I thought that was interesting. I can swear or dress in secondhand clothes or not answer letters without having people attribute these choices to the bad morals, the poverty, or the illiteracy of my race. I can speak in public to a powerful male group without putting my race on trial. I can do well in a challenging situation without being called a credit to my race. I am never asked to speak for all the people of my racial group. Very important. I can remain oblivious of the language and customs of persons of color who constitute the world's majority without feeling in my culture any penalty for such oblivion. I can criticize our government and talk about how much I fear its politics and behavior without being seen as a cultural outsider. Again, feeling like we're connected, feeling like we belong is a very important um, aspect of feeling safe within our culture and feeling um, having a positive um, experience within our psyche. I can be pretty sure that if I ask to talk to the person in charge, I will be facing a person of my race. You know, um, you can bring gender into this. You can bring, uh, there's all kinds of things you can bring into this. I think that whole, you know, you're privileged if you're not on the autism spectrum, aren't you? Um, you're privileged if you are heterosexual. You are, you are privileged um, if you stay in the same community for several years and you know the neighborhood, you know the people. That's a privilege, isn't it? There's a lot of families that move around that don't feel that same sense of privilege. So think about privilege, uh, talk about it. This is a conversation you should be having with, you know, children, spouses, friends, colleagues, uh, coworkers, clients. Privilege is an important conversation to be having right now. And um, it, it, can be, it can be had on, um, on safe, in a safe way. It doesn't have to be a toxic conversation. It can be a safe conversation. What we need to do is help all po all people. And remember, social workers, our biggest quest is to help those who are vulnerable. And so um, those who don't feel the same privilege that you might are, are some of those who are vulnerable. All of you, you know, whatever your race, whatever your sexual orientation, um, you are privileged in that you are getting educated, aren't you? And you may be working with people, you may in your future be working with clients who haven't had that same privilege as you, who haven't had that same opportunity. And a big part of what you're doing is passing on that privilege to your clients. So I'm excited to read your papers this week, read that worksheet as you answer those questions. I'm, I'm interested in, in hearing you know, what your thoughts are. And thanks for listening. Don't hesitate to call, text, or email if you have any questions or concerns.